Welcome to the stage, the president of the Vanderbilt Alumni Association, Patty White. The president of the Vanderbilt Student Government, Lizzie Shanazarian. <laughs> Chancellor Nicholas Zeppos. and our 2016 Senior Class Day speaker, Soledad O'Brien. Good morning. My name is Sarah Nades. For the last year, I have served as the president of the Vanderbilt Interfaith Council and of Vanderbilt Hillel. We are all here today to celebrate the completion of this chapter in our lives. While we spread out across the globe, it is important that we take with us not only what we learned in the classroom, but also the respect for others that a place like Vanderbilt has helped us cultivate. On this campus, we are lucky enough to have a student body that strives to celebrate diversity more and more with each class. While many aspects of diversity are so often used to divide us, they are powerful tools when we use them to unite us. I have been lucky enough to see firsthand the amazing things that can result from genuine interfaith cooperation and respect. I have seen groups of students of different faith backgrounds come together to do service projects and have critical conversations. While religious conflicts exist in some parts of the world and even in this country, I have seen religious groups here supporting each other in times of crisis and times of need. We have been lucky enough to be in this very religiously diverse place that is also in many ways committed to furthering peace and understanding between all people. Over the past few years, many of us have been challenged to question our previously held convictions, to critically think about the world, and to discover new values. Now it's time for us to carry the commitment to these values into the world outside of Vanderbilt. Our generation is the most pluralistic, most multi-faith and multi-ethnic, most globally aware and civically engaged ever. We have the potential to do great things in a world that is changing more rapidly than it ever has before. I believe that we can be the generation to make our faith not part of the problem, but part of the solution. Now I have the privilege of sharing some thoughts from my own faith tradition. Generally speaking, the Jewish people place a huge amount of value in education, and many believe that there are a few things as important as knowledge. As Jews, we are taught never to take anything at face value. Questioning, arguing, debating, all of these are very Jewish things to do. Whether you are reading a novel or listening to a political debate, it is imperative to reach your own conclusions, and the way to do this is to question all the time. In the same vein, such wonderful learning can happen when people who have completely different opinions come together to share and learn from one another. This zeal for learning is something that I love about my faith, and in my experience, Vanderbilt has certainly encouraged the same spirit in its students. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning and namaskar. My name is Dea Maldash, and I've served as the president of Vandy Karma for the past year, um, the Hindu organization on campus. Today, I'm going to share a quote from the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is one of the great epics of Hinduism. Today, I've chosen one of these quotes to share with you. Chapter 2, Shloka 47 reads, Karmanye vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana. The translation reads, Do not focus on the fruits of your actions. Rather, complete your duties as they are meant to be. As we approach graduation, I find solace in this quote. 
If we complete our duties without the results as our end goal, we will not be distracted by the possibility of success or failure. Rather, we can be assured that Bhagavan, or God, will take care of us if we complete our duties. In the next chapter of our lives, I hope that you let this quote bring you peace as you begin to figure out the next journey for you. Thank you. Good morning and salam to all. My name is Safiya Hassan, and I have been on the MSA Muslim Students Association Executive Board for the past four years. Islam teaches us that we must constantly better ourselves and increase our knowledge. Our religion teaches us that sabrun jamil, patience, is beautiful. The Quran teaches us that Allah is the best of planners. I implore you to take these lessons as we further our studies and our careers post-graduation. We must have patience in the current political climate. We must continue learning outside of Vanderbilt, and we must always remember that no matter how much we plan our lives, Allah is truly the best of planners, and his will comes before ours. I leave you all with my favorite quote, as Sayyid Ahmad al-Rifai said. I have kept it in mind throughout my college experience, and I know it is applicable to every single one of our futures. It goes, my heart is at ease because I know whatever was meant for me will never miss me, and whatever misses me was never meant for me. May Allah make it successful in our future endeavors. Ameen. Good morning. I'm Becca Ferranti, and I have served as president of Canterbury Circle for the past two years. We will all enter a new season of life after tomorrow. Here at Vanderbilt, you might have been blooming like the spring or dormant like the winter. There will certainly be upcoming days full of change where we feel that cold, hopeless winter. In this time, I hope that you find inner strength from yourself, your communities, and from God to persevere until that spring of rejuvenation comes. We can search for that divine spark, the lights in our souls, to help us see God within us. As we find our passions and livelihoods, that divine spark of the soul will come alive. We not only find God within us during these times of change, but also in the presence of our communities. I hope that you all find strength in God within you and around you in your journey. Welcome, class of 2016. Congratulations. My name is Patty White, and I'm the president of the Vanderbilt Alumni Association. On behalf of over 136,000 alumni around the world, let me be one of the first to welcome you to membership in the Alumni Association. We're thrilled. I hope you are, too. And I suspect there are more than a few parents in the audience who are thrilled and ever so proud. While it may seem a bit daunting to leave the familiar faces and places of the Vanderbilt bubble behind as you contemplate life after Vanderbilt, trust me, you are prepared. You have spent your time on campus or abroad honing skills, acquiring knowledge, and developing talents so that you can thrive in a fast-changing world. Your Vanderbilt network has just expanded from the 1,600 classmates graduating with you tomorrow to the worldwide alumni community in over 140 countries. Wherever you go, there is likely to be an alum that is already there. None of us can predict the twists and turns our life pathways will take. If you had told me when I graduated 40 years ago that I would move to five cities and spend more than half that time in Europe, I would have been incredulous. Life has certainly been a grand adventure, and I have been grateful for fellow alumni every step of the way. So when you go to grad school or take your first job in a new city, Connect with the alumni there. Sign up with VU Connect and keep your details current 
so you can receive directly information about local chapter events. If the only address that Vanderbilt has for you is your parents' home in Dallas, you won't get information about local alumni events if you're working in New York City. Join the Vanderbilt LinkedIn group. Like us on Facebook. Y'all are expert on social media, so just do it. Every class of graduating seniors stands on the shoulders of all the alumni who have gone before. Their sustained and generous support has enriched your experience here. From Opportunity Vanderbilt, to endowed chairs for outstanding faculty, to the commons and college halls, alumni support has been invaluable. Through your support of the Senior Class Fund, you have acknowledged the importance of giving back and paving the way for future Commodores. Keep up the great work. Commencement is the beginning of life after Vanderbilt, but it also means that you are now Vanderbilt for life. You're ready and so are we. Welcome to the Alumni Association. Good morning. My name is Lindsay Edwards, and this past year I had the pleasure of serving as the overall chair for the Senior Class Fund. The Senior Class Fund serves a unique and important role. Not only is it a way to give back to Vanderbilt, but also a way to give back to the specific organizations that shaped your four years and your experiences here. It is truly a way to say thank you, to ensure that those experiences are experienced by all the future Commodores. Before I continue, I have to thank my exceptional officers who, along with our 100 senior committee members, led the charge. To Ariana Rutitu, Sean Albert, Amy Tom Hillsman, Gabby Feldman, and Jasmine Lawrence, thank you so much. To anyone who volunteered at our numerous events, thank you. And to our advisor, Chandler McDonald, we couldn't have done it without you. This year, our goal was higher than ever before, but we did it. 75% participation, a new record. Wow. <laughs> to every senior who participated, thank you for showing you'll continue to support Vanderbilt. It wouldn't be, we wouldn't be where we are today without the generosity of those who believe in this institution. Thank you to our generous challenge donor, alum and trustee Alex Taylor, who dared us to do more by offering, by offering $50,000 in challenge funds, which I can now proudly say we have secured. After we cross the stage tomorrow, we will bear some of the responsibility for continuing to raise this university to new heights. As Chancellor Zeppo said, you can't move forward without giving back. I can say with confidence that this class will do just that. Now, I'd like to ask Chancellor Zeppo to join me at the podium. On behalf of the class of 2016, I'd like to present this banner that represents our journey towards the 75%. Wow, <laughs> Good morning, faculty, family, friends, and distinguished guests, and a very special good morning to Vanderbilt University's Class of 2016. My name is Lizzie Chanazarian, and I am the Vanderbilt Student Body President. It is a great honor to be here in front of you today, less than 24 hours before we walk across the commencement stage, receive our diplomas, and take our first steps into the next chapters of our lives. Today, we reflect on both our amazing time at this great institution and all that we have learned. Well, we are here to celebrate and give thanks for our successes. I thought it would also be beneficial to spend a few minutes talking about situations when we didn't meet that standard. Four years ago, I couldn't have dreamed that I would be on this dais with distinguished guests and renowned luminaries like Soledad O'Brien and Chancellor Zeppos. 
mainly because four years ago, I was a waitlist candidate for admission at Vanderbilt. Admission to our alma mater was not easy for me. The good news is that my waitlist was only temporary. After a month of very, very frequent calls and emails to the Vanderbilt admissions office, I received a call on May 23rd, 2012, notifying me of my acceptance. The admission officer even added that the admissions board was actually appreciated my perseverance and had never received so many calls from someone on the wait list. <laughs> Friends who work in the admission office tell me they continue to tell the story of my perseverance. Sometimes prevailing after having first met resistance makes the outcome even more satisfying than when things come easily. Throughout my time at Vanderbilt, I have been passed over for opportunities and leadership positions and struggled with grades in some of my classes. I even changed my major four times. There have been times that I felt subordinate to my phenomenal peers, and I allowed my perceived inadequacies to limit me. During those times, I would think back to the sage words of Eleanor Roosevelt. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Also, my Vanderbilt experience has taught me you can't be the best at everything. The only thing you can be the best at is being yourself. You must carve your own path, find your passions, and chase them. I once heard a professor state what I'm trying to say. Do what you can with what you have where you are. I think this speaks well to what I deem my most important lesson during my four years at this institution. Despite our perceived inadequacies and times of struggle, Vanderbilt is awarding us all diplomas tomorrow. The seminal event will commemorate our hard work and the education we received, accomplished through countless hours we have spent in Central Library, the epiphany moments we had writing papers and finally deciding what it was we were trying to argue, and debates we had in class defending arguments we spent, we spent for days carefully crafting. However, the education we have received at Vanderbilt goes far beyond the academic requirement to earn a diploma. It includes conversations we had with friends on the commons arguing until 2 a.m. about political beliefs, the time we were too scared to pursue an internship or leadership position because we feared rejection but nevertheless persevered, and the moments you laughed so hard you couldn't breathe just sitting in rand. Who can forget the first day of spring on alumni lawn when everyone is wearing shorts and playing frisbee despite the fact that it's 60 degrees. Or the time we performed on stage in Diwali or in ANYF and we felt completely out of our comfort zones. And our brief lapses of judgment that told us it was okay to skip that one Buckles econ class. Or many. Our greatest accomplishments are not the honors that we receive, the leadership positions we graduate with, or the jobs waiting for us. Our greatest accomplishments include harnessing the quirks and flaws that make us human and help us to connect with and grow with those around us. At a place like Vanderbilt, filled with extraordinary people, it is often hard to remember that the things that make us extraordinary are in fact the ordinary. When you reflect on your time at this extraordinary place, I hope you look back with pride at your successes as well as your failures. On behalf of all the graduates today, thank you to our families, faculty members, and friends. Your love and guidance and education, both in the formal academic sense and through life's lessons, enabled us to share these milestone days. It is now my distinct privilege to introduce to you a role model and friend of mine, Chancellor Nicholas Zepos. Well, that was very nice, and welcome to Senior Day. It's going to be a great day. We're going to have a lovely commencement tomorrow. I've been playing with my weather dials. I think I've got everything tuned in for tomorrow, so I think that's taken care of. I hope many of you could enjoy us, enjoy the party last night. And uh, it, was, it was really great music, great friendship, great community, really the very, very best of Vanderbilt. Um, it was nice to have Deacon show up. Uh, and play a set or two. And uh, my only concern was I thought there were more parents rushing the stage, getting their pictures taken. But I was up there too, so I told him I'd want to go on tour with him next week. He said, I'll get back to you. So thank you, Lizzie. 
and um, you have been a, a phenomenal partner in what I think is a unique part of Vanderbilt, which is the students and the administration, the faculty, always opening up offices, opening up arms to each other to really say, how do we listen and learn from each other and all try to make Vanderbilt a much, much better place? You've been a great friend and a great colleague and counselor in your year of service. She has a very, very difficult job. I also want to extend my appreciation to Lindsay Edwards. and the other senior class fund officers for their inspired efforts to motivate until I think I was told about 11.30 last night um, to give back to this great university. We have an amazing 75% participation and that's more than 1,100 seniors who contributed to this extraordinary outpouring of support for alma mater. I think it really affirms for me and for so many other people that this is something worth supporting, that this is an institution that has made a difference in your lives and that there's something about it that even when you're leaving after paying a lot, you've received a lot and you want to give back. And I don't think there are any more beautiful seedlings that are being planted in a beautiful garden called Vanderbilt than these senior participation gifts. I know our future is secure. I also want to thank Sarah Nades, the president of the Interfaith Council, as well as Deya Maldas, Sophia Hassan, Rebecca Ferranti for their eloquent and really moving spiritual blessings for our community. I think they illuminate the traditions, the many traditions, the tenets of all the individual faiths that we have on our campus. And they shine a light not on difference, but really, I think, on a beautiful shared humanity that we embrace and we hope you will go out and teach others to embrace in your city, in your state, in your nation and in our world. We are really defined by our people and the diversity of our community, and we celebrate the faiths that we have as we all work together to weave a fabric of a beautiful faith community and a community that we love called Vanderbilt. I would also like to recognize Patty White, president of the Vanderbilt Alumni Association, for her steady leadership and representation of 130,000 Vanderbilt alumni. Incredible work by Patty. And Patty, uh, Patty went to Vanderbilt, I think went to Harvard Law School, yes. But, and I always kind of get people saying, well, you're really changing Vanderbilt, you know, what's it going to become? And I, I was sitting here and I had a big smile on my face and Patty said, y'all. And so, welcome, y'all. In honor of the vision, really, of our founder, Cornelius Vanderbilt, who I always remind everyone was not an extraordinarily generous man, and he somehow got motivated largely by his second wife, you affectionately refer to her as Crawford, Frank Crawford Armstrong Vanderbilt, to make a large gift to this university. When he did so, it was in the ashes of the Civil War, and he said, if I can do something to heal humanity, to heal up the wounds of our nation, I will be very pleased with what I have done. He never came to the campus. He never was educated. But his founding gift that built this university from the start really was inspired by this idea of healing of caring, of a common humanity. So during commencement week, we celebrate this mission. We celebrate our founding of a common humanity. Most importantly, on Senior Day, we carry forward a tradition made possible by our very distinguished alumnus, Ed Nichols, and his wife, 
Janice Nichols with the presentation of the Nichols Chancellor's Medal. Created and endowed Created and endowed in the memory of Ed's parents, Edward Carmack Nichols and Lucille Hamby Nichols, this award pays tribute to a true humanitarian who has dedicated her time and efforts to caring and compassionate work that makes a positive difference in the lives of others. Janice and Ed, you are with us today, and I would like to recognize them for their generosity in establishing this medal and the symbolism of aiding and serving humanity. Ed and Janice, please stand up to be recognized. <laughs> On behalf of the entire Vanderbilt community, I am honored to welcome our senior class day speaker, Soledad O'Brien. What can I say? I've, I told her I was a fan of hers when she was this tall. And I said, she's going to make it big. What did I know? Not this big, I didn't think. Ms. O'Brien is an award-winning journalist, documentarian, news anchor, and producer. She's the visionary behind Starfish Media Group, a multi-platform media production and distribution company dedicated to uncovering and producing transformative stories that examine the divisive, the often ignored issues of race, class, wealth, poverty, and opportunity. This remarkable originator of the highly successful documentary series, Black in America, Latino in America, her use of personal narratives, her interviews, have sparked important and desperately needed conversations about the minority experience, discrepancies in our public education system, and the immigrant influence in reshaping and shaping our communities and our culture. Ms. O'Brien's coverage of issues surrounding race has garnered two Emmy Awards, and she has earned a third Emmy for her reporting on the 2012 presidential election. Her in-depth coverage of Hurricane Katrina for CNA, CNN was recognized with a George Foster Peabody Award. And for her reporting on the BP Gulf Coast oil spill, she was also presented with the Peabody. When the incredibly destructive tsunami wrecked havoc on Southeast Asia in 2004 that seemed so far away to many of us in America, Ms. O'Brien kept the world and all of us abreast of the devastation. And for this, she received an Alfred I. DuPont Award. In 2010, she was named Journalist of the Year by the National Association of Black Journalists. And Newsweek magazine has heralded her as one of the 10 people who make America great. Her alma mater, Harvard University, named Ms. O'Brien a Distinguished Fellow in 2013. In the same year, she was appointed to the Board of the Directors of the Foundation for the National Archives. In those deep, dark, gloomy days and weeks following Hurricane Katrina, Ms. O'Brien and her husband Brad were not content simply to sit without hope. Instead, they lit a candle and they created the Soledad O'Brien and Brad Raymond Starfish Foundation to provide opportunities to disadvantaged young women to get to and go through college. This year, they provided funding to open doors and windows of opportunities for 25 deserving young women to realize that the American dream of attaining a college education was in fact not a dream, but a reality. Ms. O'Brien has chosen to donate generously a significant portion of the prize that comes with the Nichols Chancellor's Medal to the Starfish Foundation. I am deeply heartened to know that the Nichols, Medal's Chancellor's, Nichols Chancellor's Medal will strengthen the Foundation's mission and be a partner providing financial assistance, mentoring, and support to help scholars, to help young people like you achieve their full potential. So I am very, very...
So I am very pleased and proud to present to Soledad O'Brien the Nichols Chancellor Medal. You're, you're fabulous. Let me get out of here. Thank you so much. It's beautiful, and I am incredibly honored. And Ed and Janice, thank you so much. Chancellor, thank you. It's nice and toasty in here. Good thing I'm good at 85 degrees, huh? Good morning to the class of 2016. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of your celebrations this weekend. Today, as you know, you are surrounded by those who truly love you best and really are responsible for getting you so far. Your parents and your grandparents, and your siblings and your friends. And it's because of them, because of their love and their support, their pushing at times, that you are positioned for the futures you are now facing. And if I can speak to the grandparents and parents for a moment, I know that you are in the audience and you are looking at your child about to graduate. They might be 21 years old, but they are still your baby. And I know the feeling of this day approaching. I flew in yesterday with a woman whose niece is in the 2016 graduating class, and she told me how excited she was. And I have four children. And in New York City, we celebrate and cry over fourth grade graduation. So I know what this moment feels like. Your baby is leaving the nest and they are off to their real life. Today, I'd like to lay your fears to rest. They are not really leaving you. And no, I'm not speaking metaphorically. Like, literally, they're not leaving you. They're gonna be home with their laundry, their friends, and their stuff. They, they're not leaving, and between now and data tells us, the age of 40, they will be back in their own bedrooms at least three times. No joke. Now, students, you may feel like today is the end of an era, a day you say goodbye to the community that you know, a weekend where you lose those friends that you've had for years, saying goodbye to your school. And again, I will lay your fears to rest. You're not. Vanderbilt will keep track of you forever. <laughs> Do you think it's a coincidence that Patty got up here and spoke early in the program? There is a person in the alumni office right now, right at this moment, who is licking 1,600 envelopes. Hey, just reaching out, just touching base. Just want to get your new mailing information. Did at Vanderbilt alum just start following you on Twitter? Not a coincidence. And they will send you a barrage of emails about fundraisers, because now you're about to be alums. You'll have jobs. You have actual money that does not belong to your parents. That means that you're actually potential donors. There are those of you who are going on to investment banking, where you will work 120 hours a week, your first year as an analyst. They probably didn't tell you, but there will be days when you work all day, all night. You take a shower and you go back to work. There will be a point where your own mother will not be able to get a hold of you on the phone, and Vanderbilt will track you down. <laughs> there are those of you who are joining the Peace Corps in the remotest parts of the globe. The Vanderbilt Alumni Association will track you down, even if the village has no cell service. Trust me on this. Now, you know how class day is supposed to work. I should sit up here and, as a speaker and spout some brilliance, and you guys should be sponges and take it all in. But, but truly, generally speaking, I don't give advice, and I'll tell you why. Many years ago, I was asked by a woman's magazine if I could share the best advice my mom ever gave me. And I said, I think that's a terrible idea. Uh, my mother is an immigrant from Cuba, and she is a... Um, I would describe her as like a tough nut mom versus a, a warm and fuzzy mom. And so they were looking for gems of like sweet motherly advice and she's, that's not her. Uh, so I said, I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. And they said, no, it's a great idea. 
what is the best advice your mom ever gave you? And we'll have a, like a half page picture of you and mom hugging. I said, okay. My mom's best advice was, most people are idiots. It was. Now the editor on the phone said, <laughs> she's like, okay, we'll call you back. Never heard from her again. But it was true. It was the best advice because I think that many people will tell you and spend their lives telling you what you cannot do, what you should not do, what you'll never be able to accomplish. They'll tell you why your idea will not work and when you will fail when you've tried something that you haven't done before. And I think my mom's point was, they're idiots and you shouldn't listen. And I think my mom, in some ways, would be in a position to know. My parents are both immigrants to this country. They met in 1958. My dad is white and Australian, and my mom is black and from Cuba. And they met because they attended daily mass. My mom would walk, but my dad had a car, and so he would drive up next to my mom, who was also walking to mass, and basically hit on her, right? He'd wind down the window. At young people, there used to be no power windows, so you have to like lean in and wind down the window. And every day, she'd, he'd say, do you want a ride? And she would say, no, thank you, because you don't take a ride from someone you don't know well, even if you're gonna go sit next to them in church, apparently. And so one day, she said, yes, I would like to take a ride. And they made a date to go on a date. And that night, every single restaurant that they went to in Baltimore, Maryland, in 1958, turned them away. Because my mom is black and my dad is white. And they would say to my father, you can come in. And they would say to my mother, you, absolutely not. And the two of you, certainly not. And so my mom, after being turned away from restaurant after restaurant after restaurant, took my father back to her apartment and because she's an amazing cook of Cuban food, whipped him up an amazing meal. And when she would share that story with me and my three sisters, her entire point was, see girls, if you can cook, you can get a man. <laughs> I have a counter saying, which is, I can't make it, I'm a horrible cook, but I can make it happen. My parents decided that they would get married at the end of 1958 when interracial marriage was illegal in their state, Maryland, and 16 other states in the nation. And they drove to Washington, D.C., and they got hitched, and then they drove back to Baltimore and lived illegally as a married couple. And their friends would say, whatever you do, do not have children because biracial children will not fit in this world. I'm number five of six. My parents were terrible listeners every step of the way. And from that, I have truly learned, do not listen to other people's take on the life you should lead. My parents were excellent role models in not listening. And so I won't give you advice today, but I will tell you what I have seen. By not listening, you can figure out what your heart is telling you to do. When I was an undergraduate studying English and American literature, I was pre-med, and then eventually I realized that telling stories might be what I wanted to do, and I switched. And I started working at a local, local TV station. Kind of worked out. I now travel the globe reporting stories. Not taking advice means you'll break those boundaries, those walls that exist, that make us feel like we're different from other people that we meet. Not taking advice means you'll stop looking for meaning in things that have no meaning. Listen, some relationships are not meant to be. Delete those numbers off your phone and move on. And bad things sometimes happen, and they continue to happen until good people get in the way. I have seen this time and time again in every story I have covered. So be that good person. Decide what you want to be, and I'm not talking about a job. I'm talking about the kind of human being you want to be. It is up to you and no one else. People can be mean and they can be unfair, but more, far, far more people are good and they're generous and they're helpful and they're hopeful. And that means you're going to have to lead with an open heart. And it also means that little heart is probably gonna get stomped on a few more times than you'd like. But if you go where your passion and your heart leads you, I guarantee you, you will have incredible experiences because I have. Leaning in, as Sheryl Sandberg likes to say, do it. It's not just a strategy for women in business early in their careers. I think it's good advice for everybody. 
But I would add this, lean in to use your voice and make change where it needs to be made and lean in to invest your heart and soul in ideas and people that maybe other people don't even care for or maybe they don't even see the value in. Because leaning back when you're young, honestly, is just another word for cynicism. And that's not clever when you have been given all the advantages that you have been given in education if you have earned the opportunity to be sitting in the audience here today. Use your power as a millennial to make those changes where you are. Today, millennials in the workforce really confuse older people. I just attended a conference a couple of days ago where business people sat around discussing their strategies for attracting and retaining millennial employees. They described how their youngest employees came together to advocate for change within one particular company around, in this particular case, the parental leave policy. Millennials in the company felt it should be for both men and women who were new parents. The corporate leadership listened and the policy was quickly changed. That differs a lot from how my first boss at WBZ-TV in Boston in 1987, I will not name him, although he deserves it, uh, talked to his employees who were young and trying to make it. He said to us, there is a 747 flying over this building right now full of people who would love to have your job, so suck it up. Charming, right? But it means you have power to make change that can impact real people. And that is not a responsibility to take lightly. In 1958, my mom and dad were living as a married couple in Baltimore, Maryland. And my mother would tell me how people would spit on them as they walked down the street with my two older sisters who were born in Baltimore. And I said to her, oh my gosh, how did you deal with that? And she said this thing that actually framed a lot of how I think about reporting. She said, oh, lovey, she calls me lovey, oh, lovey, we knew America was better than that. And we knew we'd have a part in making it better. That was their philosophy. And she also knew that if you were knocked off your path, anytime somebody spit on you, whether it was literally or it was metaphorically, you might not get to where you were trying to go because she had a dream, which was the American dream, and a dream that she would realize, coming out of poverty in Cuba, of all six of her children graduating from college and her grandchildren in college. So please, as my mother would advise you if she were sitting here, don't listen to idiots. Figure out your dream and be brave enough to go and live it. Otherwise, as a friend told me the other day, someone will hire you to help them with their dream. And that's really not quite as fulfilling, is it? This weekend, you will begin new and amazing things, and you will also begin a lot of mundane crap as well. Seriously, some of you should go and learn how to work a fax machine. I spent my first year out of college answering phones and removing staples from a wall. You know, they have a thing that you remove, like, that's an actual job. And we often describe finding our passion as a bolt of lightning from the sky. I, I found my passion and went on to paint the Sistine Chapel. No, I actually think it's not that at all. I think it's more like a slog. I think the, the, the path to passion is actually a daily step of trying and sometimes failing, of reaching your goals, sometimes deciding when you get there it wasn't the right thing. It is not a thunderclap. It is a slow, chip away at it process. I got my, door in the, uh, I got my toe in the door of TV news and discovered lots of things I hated to do and a couple of things I liked to do. I got good at taking coffee orders. I figured out which reporters were helpful to young journalists like me. I did overnight shifts until I could knock out 30-second stories about overnight fires. I got a local TV gig reporting, and I did live shots literally holding fish sometimes. I once did a compelling interview about a cat that they believe was reincarnated from a roommate. My husband kindly described that as not my best work. I stood on the Bay Bridge in San Francisco in a windstorm and I told people, do not come to the Bay Bridge and stand on the Bay Bridge in a windstorm because it is dangerous. And in doing often cliched and lame reporting at times, I discovered a whole world I never knew about, which was actual people 
and their real untold struggles in systems that sometimes failed them. And those stories kept me up at night, and I couldn't just tell them and go. I wanted to stay and connect the dots and highlight the people whose work around those issues was effective. And so I discovered, after about 15 years, my actual passion, which was leveraging the power of a microphone to bring attention to an uncovered story. It took that long to figure out my dream. And my dream would turn out to be to telling stories of people whose stories often were not told, people like my mom, like many people in this audience, people who are on the cusp of amazing things if they decide to be brave and committed to what life could be, unfettered from expectations of others, and truly, truly unafraid to try. It took time. It was a slog. And I think probably my biggest strength was I just didn't stop. I just kept going. What I have seen in my career, whether covering tsunamis in Asia or Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans or earthquakes in Haiti or veterans coming home from Afghanistan, is that pretty much everybody wants the same thing. We're much more alike than we are different. You need to break through walls that you think exist between people who look like you and don't look like you, people who don't act like you, you need to seek to understand why people act like they do, why people do what they do. Seek to know people where they are. You don't always have to agree. But having conversations, I think, is the only way to bridge the distance in understanding each other. Not taking advice means you can choose to stand up for people who need your voice. You will have the chance, unfortunately, every day to say, this is not okay. Or you can choose to walk by and avert your eyes when you see an injustice, big or small. But I encourage you, be that person who stops. And at the risk of not voicing a popular opinion, say, this is not okay. This is not okay because America is better than that. You have some of the greatest education that money can buy if you're sitting here. And I think that means that you then have an obligation because not everybody has gotten that chance that you got. And that obligation is to use the power that you've been given to help others who have not been quite so fortunate, to use your voice in defense of people who cannot speak for themselves, to use your access and your influence to advocate for other people. People often use the analogy of those oxygen masks coming down on an airplane as a, as a metaphor for taking care of yourself first and then only then are you positioned to take care of others. But I don't even think that's true. I've never had an oxygen mask deployed while I was flying, but I do know if I were sitting next to my child and an oxygen mask came down, there is not a parent in here who wouldn't first put it on their child's face and then take care of themselves next. That is the selflessness that I have seen over and over again in my reporting. That's just what we do. To me, you do not need to get yourselves settled first before you help others, the metaphorical oxygen mask. Every step of the way, even when we feel we don't have much to give, we can give of ourselves, of our respect, of our time, of our ability to listen. You do not need to be rich. You do not need to have a foundation to make a difference in someone's life. You don't even need to have a regular paycheck or a certain career path. So much of what led me to my passion was working with people who struggled, who had nothing, when I had nothing. I founded an organization that sends girls to and through college, but my work really in that space began well, well before we officially did it. My final words of non-advice to you, class of 2016, is don't let people kill your joy. You will find them, they will glom onto the bottom of your shoe like gum, and so I would tell you that starting today, remove people from your life who make you feel bad about who you are and who you'd like to be. Block them on Twitter, unfriend them on Facebook, and do the same thing in real life. Don't let people steal your joy or your hope in a better opportunity. You have lives ahead of you to do well and to do good in this world and to be great and to be good to others and to find greatness and to seek out goodness in other people because you might not believe it at times, but it is all around us every single day. Graduation will be a day of big questions. 
What do you want to be? What do you want to stand for? When are you moving out of the home? When are you packing your stuff up out of your bedroom? Some of those questions. But truly, superseding all of them, I think, is what do you care about? What do you care about? You have been positioned, class of 2016, to do some pretty amazing things. But do them in the service of others. And I think you will discover that selflessness is ultimately very much part of what will make you great. Congratulations and good luck. Well, thank you so much, Soledad, for your story, the story of your parents, their journey through an America that we know every day can be much better, for the inspir inspirational message drawn from your years of reporting, traveling the world, and removing staples off of a board. Thank you so much for sharing your time and wisdom today. Clearly, your words will be remembered by the audience and resonate with them in the days, weeks, and years ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, commencement week, however, continues to our climax tomorrow with a variety of more fun things, receptions, ceremonies, and I know this will be at the top of your list. You can engage in timely and intellectually stimulating lectures today, delivered by members of our world-class faculty. I granted tuition waivers for everybody. <laughs> they begin at 2 o'clock in Wilson Hall. I encourage you to participate in as many activities as you can and as stamina allows. Seniors particularly, drink from this beautiful stream called Vanderbilt. You have already started to nourish it and care for it. It will always be here for you. But in these last days, drink from that stream. Thank you so much. Thank you for attending this year's Senior Class Day. Ladies and gentlemen. To the faculty seminars held in Wilson Hall, beginning at 2 o'clock and 3.15. Shuttles will continue to run to the garages until noon. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you.